I'm going to refer to PIG. So when you talk about, and, oh, and the other should like, when you talk about access to scientific uh, advancement, the examples you brought are all about package, package technology. Like, uh, and I understand the necessity of that, of package technology in that case, but I'm not sure that's the only focus we should have, or even the major focus, because we need to remember that besides medicine, some technologies are not appropriate relevant for some regions. So I was actually thinking while you were talking uh, about the discussion on open access to scientific publications and data, which in many cases is actually more relevant for some developing countries than the package and the technology. And I was just curious if you guys thought about that or if that is in some of the, the, uh, test, uh, the working groups you put together, for example. Uh, because actually people sometimes share that stuff, even industries, even if it's for, to prevent uh, defense, like defense publishing strategies, right? Uh, and now we have all these discussions on public mandate, uh, 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 of open access for public funded research or data and articles coming in many countries and even for open educational resources. But I don't see that within this human rights framework yet. So is that a good framework? Is that a framework that makes sense in that debate? Would that have more impact in some countries than just fight with publishers and and people that don't want to share data, so that I, I just want to... So I think the point you raised implicates a, a, a broader tension in how we talk about within the right to science and culture, the tension between the discourse of access, which can sometimes sound passive, sometimes sounds like I'm, I'm ready to just simply receive and consume a commodity that's been put together by somebody else, um, and the other side of it, which can sometimes <laughs> discursively be less emphasized, which is the participation, but which is very important in the in the conceptualization of this right, right? So it's the right to take part in cultural life, it's participation there, and that cultural participation includes participation in the scientific process as part of the culture, and includes opportunities to tinker with technology. So when you spoke about opportunities to take technology and tailor it to a particular context that's different and has different needs from where that technology might have originated. Um, you saw that as being relevant to, you know, we need the scientific knowledge so that we can tailor it um, and copyright the way that it, it'll apply to scientific journals. But I think also very relevant patent barriers uh, are also going to complicate that process of local adaptation and localization and innovation. Um, and so one way in which intellectual property frustrates access to new technologies is that it makes it more difficult to tinker with and to change and to have that gradual innovation. Um, it, here's a concrete example that, that I think about a lot is that um, oral contraceptives are incredibly popular in the United States. They're not stable at hot temperatures, eight degrees, whatever. They're, they're completely useless um, in, for people who don't have air conditioning lifestyles. Um, and the, the patent regime makes it difficult for companies in other countries to take that technology and to tinker with it and to roll out oral contraceptives that would work uh, in, in that context. So there's so many ways in which technology does need to be tinkered with and adapted in order to be useful. It's not simply about taking a standard form of technology and, and making sure that it, it reaches everybody. There's more of a, of a creative process there. We also need to be aware of the limitation of the human rights approach. So when we talk about intellectual property as human rights, one of the major constraints we always talk about is that you can only get so much that will allow you to maintain uh, human dignity and to uh, maintain uh, human subsistence. But you don't necessarily have the right to get all the material interest out of intellectual property rights. 
And so when we think about the right to get benefit of scientific advancement, we also don't have the right to every single technology. We have the right to a technology that will allow you to maintain human subsistence and to maintain human dignity, but not necessarily more than that. So there's a limitation as to how much we can go so far in terms of using human rights. Yeah, um, so thank you, thank you very much for, for the presentation. Uh, so my question could follow up a bit on Karina's question about the, the issue of publicly funded technology and, 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 and whether that has been developed or articulated enough in, 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 the, in the elaboration of the rights, uh, the right of, of sharing the benefits of, of science, that, that the fact that technologies that have been developed with public money, with taxpayers' money, uh, should not be commercialized or diffused, or that at least is an interrogation, on the, ser on the same term as privately developed technologies. So the, the, the privately developed technologies, the, the argument of an incentive uh, for, for, for innovation, as IPRs, is very important. But, but it's not, I mean, in, there seems to be a strong rationale for that publicly funded technologies are widely diffused along the lines of, of, of some of the arguments you make. So, so is this issue of publicly funded technologies, could it be further developed in this exploration uh, of, of the right to science? Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Brian Austin. Um, I was going to ask uh, Leah again, um, sorry to put you on the spot, whether you agree, another question that this is like whether you agree with Peter's last comment. Um, <laughs> so, my face. Um, so, <laughs> to, 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 tease, to tease that out, I just wondered if you, um, if, if you could help with a question I struggle with a lot, which is, as a matter of sort of legal norms, what is the content of as access? Um, so there's a distinction that may be between legal norms and socially desirable uh, outcomes. Um, the Special Rapporteur uh, talks about not being deprived um, of access to science, essentially. Um, is that too high a standard? Because in some of your discussion, you talked about um, access becoming more difficult. Um, and I just wondered what the distance is between um, the kind of open access that Peter eschewed in his intervention and the standard of no deprivation, which seems extremely high. Getting to the question about the rights of scientists as opposed to the results of, of science, uh, you talked about the uh, moral and material interests of scientists as, as authors and their creative freedom. And then <coughs> earlier today, uh, Graham talked about us looking at copyright in some ways as a as a human, as a as a, uh, as a human right, so the, so the integrity of, of of authors. So if one brings this and in some ways upgrades the rights of creative authors to their works, how does this fit in with American doctrine of the work for hire rule, whereby universities can claim the copyright to works of their creative scientists, uh, and presumably if they own the copyright then they have the right of when, where, why, and whether to publish, and have the right to, to uh, suppress the work of their own faculty. Uh, hi, I'm Nelly. I'm a professor of social science on intern for this semester. And I'll kind of follow up on this question. So when we're talking about the right to scientific achievement and the scientific discovery, uh, we uh, we link it to the database protection. I mean, uh, how do you think that is like it is com a kind of conflicting because the beneficiary of the data and scientific achievement was shared by or sometimes monopolized by the data owner is uh, the data set owner instead of the author. I mean, how do you um, inform it or change it in order to facilitate this kind of human rights? Thank you. Um, all right, I guess if you grimace while somebody else on your panel is saying something, <laughs> <laughs> we call it. Uh, so Peter suggested that, that within the human rights framework, right, human rights don't extend so everywhere as maximally as possible, right, that we're really talking only about 
uh, a universal right of access to certain more basic, more essential technologies. Um, and that is, that's one of the questions that I, I flag. I haven't fully thought out my answer to that, but I'm, I'm uncomfortable with, with limiting it. Um, uncomfortable because this is, after all, a commitment to equity. And can I say that I, as a first world law professor with substantial discretionary income, I love my this and that and the other technological toys, and of course, you don't have a right to that. But also, um, because I think it is going to prove very difficult to meaningfully define what are the basic technologies. Um, when I was in South Africa, one of the um, one of the more widespread technologies was was a cell phone, and this was when I had only had a cell phone for a year. Um, and so I came from my you know. Um, uh, American perspective of this is a pretty this is a this is a luxury good sure right but it's it's about basic communication and there's there's no way to hold a job and to um, commute safely without a portable mechanism of communication so sometimes the technologies that might initially seem um, to be to be disposable luxuries um, from another perspective might actually be the essential ones. Um, but I think that'll be a fruitful and very interesting no, I line of that, actually. Yeah. yeah. I also um, want to, to, to disagree or resist or be grimace at um, <laughs> Ahmed's <laughs> suggestion that, um, that the claim for access is stronger with publicly funded technologies than with purely privately funded ones. Um, and I guess. But part of the reason that, that that makes me uncomfortable, although I, I, I definitely see it as a, as a viable political claim to say, well, you know, the public has helped pay for this, the public should benefit from it. Um, but I wouldn't want to limit it to that because I think the vision of the right to science and culture is that, is that the, the knowledge and the research that underlies this is part of the universal human inheritance. It's part of the heritage of mankind. And to some extent, it all builds on a common resource um, and that everyone should benefit of it. In the cultural field, a related concept that, that I have no end of discomfort with uh, is the idea that um, copyright is problematic for certain necessary types of literature, scientific literature or educational textbooks, and that it would be fine to, have, to leave copyright protection for um, and not be concerned about access to more frivolous cultural works, such as movies or music. Uh, and again, those things are very important to me, and it's difficult for me to tell somebody who lives on a dollar a day that they shouldn't be interested in accessing those things. Um, and, and I see the, the right to take part in cultural life as being just as relevant to reading scientific textbooks as to liberal fiction. Um, I've been asked by skeptical scientists, and I say skeptical only because they haven't really been introduced to human rights before, um, and I mentioned this right, well, does this mean that everybody has the right to a cell phone or to a you know, remote control or what have you? Um, and I think the implication being that if that's the right, then really it's meaningless because we can't expect that everybody in the world would have access to all of the technologies that we have and, and necessarily find comfort in. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's an issue with which I struggle as well. I think we may be helped, though I'm not sure, um, by thinking first about the core content of the right, and then as we discuss uh, available financial resources, then we can potentially move into, um, you know, beyond those products, services, facilities, technologies that allow us to live a life in dignity um, to, to other technologies that, that may be useful. Um, I gave <coughs> testimony before the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights on, on this right, which is, um, which is part of their mandate as well, and a question that they're pondering, or what they were at the time, was whether um, IVF women in the Americas have a right to IVF. 
and I wasn't able to say definitively yeah. one way or another, but that's that's a question with which they're grappling that I think is, is relevant. Certainly from the perspective that we have taken um, thus far at AAAS, uh, we've started with the sort of human rights notion that um, you must first give focus to marginalised and vulnerable populations and um, ensure that um, everybody has you know, the basic um, access to scientific progress to live a life in dignity from which we can then sort of uh, think about further, further rights um, and, and access. Okay. So uh, before I take more questions, now Chidi, you're on the hot seat. So I have two questions for you. Uh, so your presentation talks about conceptual challenges, and I asked you two questions about the challenges I've been struggling for years. So the first one is why is traditional may not be indigenous? Why is indigenous may not be traditional? So in trying to talk about indigenous knowledge or traditional knowledge, do you have any thoughts as to what type of approach you want to, to have in dealing with that issue? And the second question, uh, I know you just came back from Senegal. And so in a lot of countries in Africa, the indigenous people turn out also to be the majority, which is not the case in the US, in Canada, in New Zealand, and Australia, a lot of those countries where indigenous peoples are also having minority rights. So the discourse in those countries will be quite different from the discourse of indigenous rights uh, here in the developed world or in other countries similar to that. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. That is an issue I, we have grappled with working in this area. But one thing is clear, whether you call people indigenous or you call them local communities, and texts have actually tried to struggle with that. For instance, the Convention on Biodiversity talks about indigenous and local communities, so what we call the ILCs. And it recognizes that grappling with who is indigenous is something that up to today is open-ended and is context-specific. For instance, in Mexico, you think about them being a majority. Elsewhere, they are not. And we try to use marginalization to identify who is, who is indigenous and who is not. We have also tried to use a colonial encounter to define who is indigenous and who is not. In one context, it holds. In another, it fails. So the bottom line becomes really seriously speaking. For example, when we talk about intellectual property in the context of indigenous peoples, you recognize that countries like India do not have to really make a big political point out of indigeneity because when they enter into the conversation about equity, fairness, human rights, knowledge production, they are looking at it not because they are working with a civilization that is nearing extinction. And therefore, their interest is more based on political leverage and economic advantage arising from this rights project. But that is not the case with Aboriginal peoples in Canada. That is not the case with American indigenous populations. And in that case, when they come into the conversation about human rights, intellectual property, and all this, they are coming with a view to recognizing that these civilizations are under the threat of extinction. And the economic consequences of knowledge production is not a priority. It's more of self-determination, cultural preservation, and so on and so forth. So the indigenous analysis is really a significant piece of political quagmire. And so that is one point. And then, in terms of traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge, the, the point here is that WIPO has clearly made this point, that not all traditional knowledge is indigenous. But every indigenous knowledge can qualify as traditional knowledge. And the reason this is that the traditional framework is broader. And when you narrow indigenous knowledge of peoples to the small category of people recognized by international law, about 200 million of them as strictly indigenous, then when they talk about indigenous knowledge, it correlates to knowledge production of people technically defined as indigenous. But that knowledge production process in terms of the practices does not make them less traditional. So now, when you think about it, it becomes a matter of semantics. And that is why people would always want to define upfront how they are appropriating those terms. 
Well, since you mentioned libel, why don't you talk about the distinction between traditional cultural expression and traditional knowledge as well? Because I know a lot of people from the indigenous communities, they are very uncomfortable with this separation because they just don't do that. Yes, um, another point. Um, tradition, or white people have struggled with this because the broadest definition of indigenous knowledge or traditional knowledge is so, un uh, all so encompassing. When you talk about music, culture, environmental, ethics, you talk about religion, worldviews, practices related to culture, marriage, and name it. And this is everything that go to define the identity of a people and help to shape their worldview and how they see the world in relation to alternative forms of, of competing civilization. So uh, the point here becomes that when WIPO tries to put their finger into this, in this mess, it looks like this. They try to split it into those aspects of indigenous knowledge that are relevant for genetic resources or what we call the biocultural knowledge. And then they flip around and think about those that have to do with expressions of folklore, like music, song, dance. But in indigenous worldviews, seriously speaking, there is no separation across those. I'll give you an example. Um, a medicine man will start with his chanting, which is actually a poetic rendition. And through that process, he engages into dealing with medicinal plants. And then from poetry to medicine, all in the same process, and with ceremonies and cultures, and of course, environmental ethics that informed the pattern of harvesting of traditional medicine. So all within the same context. So when, in an attempt to manage knowledge governance in indigenous framework, we begin to split them to traditional knowledge, strictly so-called, and expressions of folklore. And that is really a huge conceptual challenge because we're trying to bring a system of knowledge production that is not mediated by a Western legal tradition. We want to fit it into that legal tradition. And that is why it is not holding together. Hi, um, Greg Reynolds from Dallas. Um, I guess I have two, two questions. The first one is for, um, for Chidi. This builds on Greg's humanizing copyrights project from, from earlier. And I was wondering if looking at copyright through a different lens, through a natural rights perspective, might give us an ability to reconcile human rights and intellectual property and indigenous people, indigenous people rights. So if you think of uh, the, uh, sort of the underlying copyright being autonomy or dignity, whether that's one way to potentially bridge some of the gaps. Um, or deal with some of the, the, the barriers and all that issues. And second, for the cultural access, it, it struck me that public libraries have been a very good way to uh, to make culture accessible. Um, and I was wondering if there's some of the ways in which um, maybe you have co-ops for tools or for technologies or one way through which we can encourage um, even just uh, sort of on the ground means to spread scientific advancements, so that's one effective way of building on how the libraries have been effective throughout this group of, uh, of you know, increasing access to expression. Okay, let me take the first question first, and um, I'll leave you the second one. Uh, humanizing intellectual property through copyright and how that could actually um, be applied in the indigenous people's context. Um, my sense, and particularly today when I had Graham talk about um, humanizing, humanization, um, I thought about it deeply and figured that uh, it was uh, Rochelle Dreyfus who said that um, no civilization is really better served by a knowledge production process that is, uh, expresses value on market basis. And that is really more true in indigenous worldview. And so my take on it is that indigenous process of creativity is fundamentally a humanized process. And, and it's only because the intellectual property system is dragging the indigenous knowledge production process into the market economic metrics that it is clinging onto its fundamentally humanized premise and grappling to reach the market-driven framework. 
And that is where the crisis is. And so I would really say, Graham, bring it on, because in the indigenous worldview, we begin on the premise of a fundamentally humanized process of knowledge production and reward. And, and that is really what ties in into the, the doctrine of um, access to the benefits of science and so on. If we can look backwards a little bit and in all humility to look at alternative traditions, I think there is much more to be found. I really like the, the, the question about public libraries um, because you're pointing out that this is not a marketplace that operates in a sociological vacuum, that there are social institutions that are part of the production of knowledge, part of the distribution of knowledge that can be overlooked. Um, and there's a strong interaction between those non-market institutions and the market. Um, I've read some work that suggests that there wouldn't be children's publishing in the United States if we didn't have the public library system that we have because it's the library purchasing that creates the market for those works to be viable. So there's, there's a give and take between the, the, the public-minded efforts to encourage access to science and culture and the response of, of the market. Um, and the state of, of libraries in most of the world is, is depressing. Um, <laughs> But I, I think it suggests another another line of research of what are the the broader institutional endeavors and strategies um, that that can work and and are those institutional endeavors and strategies that are outside the market or that interact with the market that are not fundamentally market driven are they um, served by stronger or weaker copyright protection? <coughs> um, does altering that um, make them more or, or less possible to occur. Um, one of the, the lines of, of thought that I've been pursuing recently is um, how, how copyright as a financial incentive for cultural production plays out in different, in different languages. Um, that English is sort of a dream market uh, for producing cultural commodities that can be marketed to a very wide wealthy audience. Um, and there are, are languages where the population is small enough and has low enough um, disposable income that the economic incentive story that we tell ourselves about copyright is just not convincing. Um, and copyright may be counterproductive in some of those contexts. Um, and how do we think about that and how do we critique that and, and find the right solutions? Um, and I think that human rights discourses is part but not all of the answer there. And I just want to add to that, um, as part of the work that we've done on Article 15, we pulled all of the uh, reports that states have written to the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, identifying when they have talked about the scientific part of Article 15. And I say when, because in many instances they haven't, and they haven't been encouraged to do so by the committee, unfortunately. Um, and we've analyzed what it is that states are reporting on. And there are many references to libraries as there are to museums, to science and technology, publicly open, available science and technology centers. Um, so those hubs for providing both information but also experiences, the, opp the opportunity to experience science, um, is something that states are recognizing as being a part of this right and presumably to their obligation to diffuse science. Uh, and then on the ad hoc, you know, on an ad hoc basis, you'll see the occasional reference to um, locations where individuals can access computers and the internet uh, you know, in, a, in a publicly open space. So I think that sort of speaks to the suggestion that you make. So let me push you to a little bit on that question. There's, uh, perhaps the question is a good one. Some people look at the internet as the public library for the future, right? So does human rights debate say anything about the modality, the format, or what of content you need to put in, in terms of what you need to provide? Or would you just link it together and say, well, we, it can be done in so many different ways, we just lump it together, the goal is to provide a scientific knowledge, but not think more about the form the benefit should take? That's a question I would have to do more thinking on than I have the opportunity to do right now in order to give a full response. But 
that something that has come across very clearly in the conversations that we've had is that scientists are aware that the information that they um, initially develop, the findings of their research and so forth, is rarely presented in a form that is digestible by anybody other than their peers, not just other members of the scientific community. If you don't come from that specific discipline, you're not going to understand it. Um, and then you couple that with a clear um, understanding of the value of communicating science to the public, there is a disconnect and it's recognized, and that is that you need to translate uh, scientific information, scientific findings, such that the population can both understand and use that knowledge. So I think when you, when you talk about the internet, and, and this is a challenge with giving sole focus to open access to scientific journals, uh, that you need to think beyond that, and you need to think about uh, the rest of us who are not scientists, while we may have access to journals, um, that's not really going to help us in understanding the implications of stem cell research or the, the research behind climate change. The, and the other key, key point, obviously, is that of language. And I don't have the information here, the data here, but obviously when you look at who's producing most of the scientific journals, they're being produced in English. And that, that causes major problems for us. all by the Dutch. <laughs> there's, a, there's a question over there and one more over there. Sure, yeah. Uh, first, I wanted to thank all the panelists for very fascinating and uh, compelling presentations. Um, one of the questions that uh, arose, I think, from this presentation, but this was really a question for the whole panel, is the question of uh, intergenerational public goods or the needs of future generations uh, in terms of access to technologies or essential technologies. Um, and this is a, a question that we've been grappling with uh, in a project that um, I co-lead uh, at the Kennedy School at Harvard, and Ahmed here is, is one of the participants in that project, and we're, we're trying to look at how you generate both uh, innovation and access to technologies across uh, food, energy, uh, water, health, as well as um, manufacturing, uh, manufactured goods. And one of the, the issues that we struggle with is how do you balance the needs for, for example, a, a clean uh, environment for the future versus the very demanding needs of the present and that there are so many unmet basic human needs today. Um, how do we think about the notion of essential technologies um, if we bring into account the, the, the interests of future generations? And the notion of intergenerality, intergenerationality, I should say, is, is included in Inga Kaul's um, initial, initial conception of global public good. So I think it's one that we've not yet grappled enough with. Uh, once we bring the dimension of time and future generations into the debate, I think it brings us full circle back to the question of how do we ensure long-term sustainable incentives and rewards for creativity, uh, innovation, um, uh, a conducive environment for that, whether it is in the form of intellectual property or other perhaps um, more socially acceptable forms of, um, of rewards. And I think this comes to the question that was raised earlier regarding the importance of public financing for, uh, for such endeavors. And so the question that I'd like to raise is to what extent or how clear or how justifiable is it to argue that there is in fact an obligation on states to contribute public funds for, to generate and to reward such creativity both within uh, their own at the national level but also in collaboration at the global level. And this is a very policy relevant debate I think when it comes to access to medicines because what the um, medicines community, I think, has finally come to um, relatively strong consensus on is that we're, we're not going to solve the neglected disease problem without uh, long-term sustainable public funding from governments. And this is a, I think this is an important step forward for the public health community, and um, I'm wondering how, how uh, much justification might be found for that position in, um, in the human rights instrument. Let's take the final two questions. There's one over there, and then Kelly and I have so another one. Yeah. follow up on you and reacting what Jessica and Ian said. I'm very afraid that we can use such argument of uh, we cannot put that in line because people will not understand. I'm very afraid of that. One, because we can think about this intergenerational concept and saying later on we're going to have more people and more machines that will help us text in line and find what we Second, because nowadays we have parents 
that have kids with a certain disease who don't understand science but spend hours reading and actually open a bioinformatic company and build a mouse and found a certain medicine in India and put all together and got that they approved in less than two years. So that actually happened. That's a true story. So I'm very concerned that some arguments can be the paternalist. And in terms of giving access to people also in developing countries, I would not give access because it's dangerous. Because they won't. So I, 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 I'm just a little frustrated with that because this argument has been used against uh, some initiatives of actually putting a lot of genetic database online and putting a lot of papers online. So uh, what are our goals here, right? And, and trusting that some things in the future are important and can deal with that problem to if we design the correct systems for those problems to be dealt with. So it's just... Okay. I have found a question over here. Yeah. Oh, there, there, there's one more. Okay, there's one more. Yeah, go ahead. It's just um, <coughs> Chile and Chile. Chile, yeah. Chile. And well, there's um, regarding the last, the last sentence you of the conclusion of your of the paper, um, there's you got in mind that there's an article in the, in the Colombian Constitution, Article Seven, uh, where there's a right for cultural and ethnic diversity, and uh, many decisions of the constitutional court. Um, the court has considered the rights of indigenous members not as, a, not, not as an accumulation of individual persons that share the same rights, but as, um, as an indigenous com community that is subject of collective rights, um, and give them the possibility to file group actions when there is um, any violation. They also, the constitutional court has given them some fundamental rights that could be considered the same rights as the other rise of the, of, the, of the whole society. Have you had an, my question was just, if you have had, a, you have had an approach to national laws or cases in which indigenous people's rights have been recognized as constitutional rights? Have <coughs> a question. Um, so, yeah, I think the question is more to you, Amanda, than to me, because I don't know the answer. Um, so you talked about this tension between uh, priorities of diffusion and access, um, that would be embodied in the human rights interests, in, in, uh, instruments of access to um, the process of scientific research, or access to science, and then that opposes privatization of knowledge, which you saw sort of embodied in patent law. But I guess I wanted to push back a little bit, um, because I think that there are a lot of debates, so I, I do more just, so I'm a, I would consider myself more of a patent law scholar with a very interest in human rights, but if you actually read the patent scholarship, there is an enormous amount um, of concern for the fact that patent law might have sort of, that is, is a huge expansion of, of, of patent law. So I was just curious as to how you thought, and I just wanted to flag, so I was thinking about, okay, what did, how could it uh, fit into the sort of pure patent law debate? And I wanted to flag like three areas, and then maybe ask you how, whether you thought that human rights could, you know, could have something to say about that. So one of them is, um, the debate about the path that was subject matter, right, and the whole controversy about intellectual property rights moving more upstream so that more and more basic research is being patentable. And that is definitely something that, outside of the human rights interest, it's generated a lot of debate in the patent community about whether that's curtailing access. So I was curious whether the human rights framework could shed some lights on what are the limits for what could be patentable. Um, and you know, the gene patenting controversy is like the, the big one. Um, the other one is um, the idea of the disclosure theory of patent law. So one way in which we often justify patent law is that you actually give patent law so that things are not kept as trade secrets. And uh, patent law actually fosters diffusion and disclosure. Um, and one potential critique would be, well, if that's the goal of patent law, that would be a hook to say, well, then if you want diffusion, you should have X, Y, Z. Um, through a human rights lens. And then the other thing I was thinking about, the last one, is um, there's a debate about um, whether patent law should be more participatory. And I think that, that seemed interesting in the, from what Jessica was saying about the participation from lay public in scientific policy making. And that you know, the Federal Circuit and the Patent and Framework Office are very technocratic. 
I'm somewhat close to public participation. So I was wondering whether you could make an argument from human rights perspective that that's, that's a lot. But those were my three, my three thoughts. OK, two minutes each. Jessica. Uh, well, I just want to clarify um, what I said. Um, I wasn't suggesting, and this, is, this goes to the question about access to scientific journals. In no way was I suggesting that we shouldn't provide access um, because for us, we can't understand it. What I was saying was that we shouldn't simply rely on access to scientific journals as the way for diffusing information. Um, so I just I wanted to make that clear. Uh, and I only want to mention something, which is sort of a model that um, is used in some countries. I think there may be a couple of examples in the US. But you talked about the patent law system being somewhat technocratic and um, not very open or participatory. There's something called consensus conferences um, that have primarily been used in Scandinavia um, and, and in Europe uh, to uh, provide an opportunity for the lay public to have input into decisions being made at the legislative level about uh, whether research of a certain type should go forward. Um, and these are lay people who have no technical background in the area whatsoever, uh, but are given the opportuni opportunity to learn in a way that they would understand and to, to raise questions that the public might raise if, in fact, the research went ahead, um, and to inform what the legislature ultimately does. That could be a model that could be adapted in some way in, in the patent context of this concern. Yeah. I'm going to need a couple of law review articles um, to answer all the great questions that I got today, but I do have one closing thought running through my mind that touches on several things um, that I've been asked about, which is that I think there's not an inconsistency in saying we can't afford to purchase everybody a smartphone, a $400 smartphone, and yet everybody who wants one should have a smartphone. Someday, that is a goal that we're progressively realizing. And resources are not adequate to, to give that to everybody. But th th we can still say that there's an easier obligation to impose on government not to, to deploy the law in ways that make it harder for people to get their hands on smartphones. Uh, so Apple sells a very expensive smartphone. They have encountered uh, competition from a cheaper smartphone being offered by Samsung. And they're trying to use patent litigation to get an injunction and to keep that competing product out of the market. That frustrates access in a way that I think is deeply problematic. Uh, and so even in our context of being a, a virtual country, we can see the ways in which the law is shaping access um, and in which a, a commitment to, to access and to making technological goods more and more affordable suggests that we can tweak, should, must, I'm not sure exactly what the, the verb is here, um, um, be sensitive to the ways in which intellectual property law promotes or, or discourages uh, that expanding access. And yes, we need incentives for new innovation, um, but I'm not so sure that patent protection <coughs> provides those incentives. I think Samsung has an incentive to innovate um, by knocking off somebody's product and making it cheaper and selling it to a new portion of the market. That's also an incentive for innovation to think about. Um, and it's, there's an open empirical question of how they truth on both sides about whether patent protection incentivizes innovation or whether competition would incentivize it better. <coughs> Okay, my answer to the issue of uh, collective rights or group rights is um, international law evolves as a two-way traffic. It either comes from above or from national practices. And so what I have seen in the last few years is, um, not few years, about more than a decade or so, there is an increasing shift from emphasis on individual rights at least based on the work of the uh, committee, to the recognition of group rights. And it is not impossible that this shift is being informed by some constitutional developments like what you mentioned that is happening in Colombia. But I need to add one, one issue to that. 
just like it was said in the panel before, we need to be very clear in terms of specificity. Because we talk about group rights, we talk about collective rights, we also talk about corporate rights. And in some constitutional frameworks, it's always good to define what is meant by group rights. Because if a group right that is said to avail indigenous peoples is defined in such a way that it is a right that derives from each member of the group as opposed to a collective right which may be almost akin to a corporate right, which is a right that is artificial, arising by virtue of the corporation being a legal entity. That is defeatist. So I'm interested in knowing how these constitutional evolutions are really coming to bear. But it's really positive and progressive. But if it is not well handled, it might actually flip against the interest of the collectives or the groups that it's designed to protect. Here's a wonderful panel. Please join me in thanking all the speakers.